Three cups of forgiveness, two cups well beaten faults. Mix these thoroughly, add tears of joy and sorrow and sympathy for others. Fold in four cups of prayer and faith to lighten the other ingredients and rinse the texture and rise the texture to great heights of Christian living. After pouring all this into your daily life, bake well with the heat of human kindness. Serve with a smile. Well, it's hard telling what you find stuck in the bookcase. Another thing I found was a book that was entitled Men of History, copyrighted in 1895. So it's going to be missing a whole lot of history that we have been through. And I want to read a verse of scripture before I get into any of the other item that I brought with me. And this is taken from Deuteronomy, the 11th chapter and verse 18. So if you want to turn with me to that. Let us stand for the reading of God's word. Beginning with the 18th verse. Fix these words of mine in your heart and mind's Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land that the Lord swore to give your forefathers, as many as the days of the heavens are above the earth. Our Father, we thank you for the word that you give to us. May it be within us at all times. May we share it with our uh, children, for it can be shared with the children and the children and so forth. And we pray, too, for Joe and Anita. We want to keep remembering them and hope that they can be, that Anita can be back with us soon. And we pray for Joe and pray for many others that are on our prayer list. And, Father, we pray for forgiveness, and we give you the praise and glory in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. There was a book that I found that I want to share some of the things with you that I found in that book. That, and the title of it is Many, May All Who Come Behind Us Find Us Faithful. And that was by Bob Russell. And I got something I want to share with you. Uh, I'm sure you all know what this is, don't you? A chair. This chair was made by my great granddaddy D. Lancey. Grandma, she fixed the seat with Baylor twine. I remember watching her fix it after it was. But this has been handed down from my great granddaddy to my grandma to my dad. And now I have it. Now if I pass it on, I'd pass it on to my son or daughter. But what will happen to it after that? Do you have pieces of furniture that was handed down to you? And you treasure them, don't you? You'd hate to see them destroyed. You'd hate to see them given to somebody else that's perhaps not related. But the thing that I'm getting at is 
How about our faith? Has the faith of our forefathers been handed down to us? Will they find us to be faithful? Were they faithful? And when I was reading this verse of scripture that was pointed out in that book, and it talks about, you know, with your kids, you want to teach them. You want to tell them everything about God so that they can, can share it and it can be handed down. And also, I went back and I knew it was somewhere else in the scripture too. Also in the uh, sixth chapter, it was almost that very same verse and it says, uh, it says, love the Lord your God with, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them in your forehead. Write these on the door frames of your house and your gates. God was telling the patriarchs of Israel, it is very important how your children perceive you in your faith. Uh, First, a scripture too in the 22nd chapter of Genesis. And I think Joe preached on this here several weeks ago, and it's about Abraham and Isaac. God told Abraham to take Isaac to Mount Moriah and there sacrifice him to him. And what did Abraham do? He gathered the wood, loaded it up, gathered Isaac, and they set out for three days till they got to Mount Moriah. He told his servants to wait here. And there was, a, there was a word here that I didn't really pick up on until I began to look at it. And Abraham said, I want y'all to wait here while we go to make the sacrifices and while we return. Do you get it? Took me a while for that to get into my thick skull. When we return, Abraham knew that if he did sacrifice Isaac, that God had the power, the ability to bring Isaac back to life. Isaac was the only son of Sarah. And God had promised Abraham, that there would be nations, there would be a descendants that would be as many as the stars in the sky and the sands on the sea. Now, according to what I read in the book, that he was saying that he understood it to say that he was showing Isaac that God was first in his life. No matter what Isaac knew or what Abraham knew, that God was first. And Abraham was saying, Isaac, do you understand that God is first? There's something that come to my mind was is how we always in the sports field and all like that, we are always want to be number one. We want to be right up at the top. I'm number one. Our team's number one, number one, number one. Well, what about God? Can we? God is number one, number one. He is first in our life. Do we show our children that we are faithful to God? 
and teach them what the scripture says and what, uh, what everything about God is about. And as I was looking at this, I had to do a self-look at myself. How much have I really showed my children that God come first in my life? My granddaddy and grandma and them was always had to be at church. And when I was growing up, there wasn't no doubt what we did on Sunday morning. We got up, had breakfast, we got ready, we went to church. There was no excuse. We force our kids to take showers. We force our kids to eat vegetables. We force our kids to do this, to take medicine, to do this and that. But then when Sunday morning comes, well, Mom, Dad, can I stay home today? I don't want to go. Get your clothes on. Let's go. Let's go. Church comes first. God comes first. And I've never really thought about it like that. That that's the way sometimes it happens. Go to sports. Go to this. Go to that. But when it comes to church, do we really emphasize that we need to be in church? Come on, kids. Let's go. One of the stories told by Bob Russell was that uh, one of the kids was uh, played in the ball. And uh, they always uh, played, wanted to play on Sunday, some of the games and stuff like that. But he, they always emphasized, you're going to church, you're going to church. Well, it finally come that the little league team was going to watch a national game. And they were all excited about it. But then when he said the date that it was going to be and the time they were going was on a Sunday, he said, told his son, he says, well, you, you can't go. We're going to be in church. Of course, he was very disappointed. All the friends go, what do I tell them? What do I tell them? Tell them you're going to be at church. That's what you tell them. Well, the time, the day come, and they were all at the bus, and the family got together and got in the car. <laughs> and what it got me was, they drove right by where everybody was getting ready. And they said he sort of sunk down in the seat. Don't nobody see him as he, as he went by. But then he went on to tell that uh, some of the games were played on Wednesday night. And the father says, well, you know, God says we need to be in church on Sunday morning. Uh, maybe play on Wednesday nights. But then right after the game, they would go to church. And one time they wanted to go to get them some ice cream. And the son said, coach, he says, I can't go. No hesitation whatsoever. His family was over getting ready to get in the car, and he went over and went with them and went to church. So his father was emphasizing that Christ come first. He was teaching his children about God being first in their life so it can be shared with his children their children, and their children for generations. Somewhere along the line, there comes a time when someone will fall away. But that happens. Some say, well, I don't want to force them to go. They won't. They'll go out. They'll quit coming. They won't have nothing to do with church. And According to the author, sometimes that does happen. But most of the time, it doesn't, a certain percentage. And a, one of the titles of one of the sections was 
priorities are demonstrated by our attitude toward the church. How is my attitude toward Sunday morning, to church, to God? Do I relate it to my children as it should be? One of the uh, stories was told as the family was sitting around. It was about Christmas time, and the phone rang. The wife answered. Yeah, uh uh-huh, okay. Be nice to see you. You going to be here for a while? You're visiting the area? Okay. Yeah, come on by a little bit. The dad says, "Mm, we can't, I want to sit and watch the ball game today. And, oh, they get here, she talks for 40, she talks forever, and he just rambles on. Oh, I wish, well, there was a knock at the door, and they come in, and they come, and they visit. Didn't stay but about 45 minutes, it says. And when they left, yeah, glad you, glad you come, glad to see you. Y'all come back. Little boy standing there about 10 years old looked at Dad, you hypocrite. <laughs> uh, that ain't what you was, you didn't want them to come. It, in the book it said he had a hard time explaining that. <laughs> How do you explain something like that to a kid? What was, uh, was we demonstrating our attitude? And I think that's, uh, that's one of the things that happens we try to force Sometimes. Um, the verse of scripture, too, in Matthew 22. I'm going to find my page here. Oh, okay. Hearing, it was verse 34, chapter 22, beginning. It says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, one of them, and expressed in the law tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the, word, in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. In other words, Jesus is saying God should be first in your life. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. God is first. Your neighbor, it might say, well, your neighbor's second. But it says to love them. Uh, Also in Psalms, there's a verse of scripture I want to, Psalm 71, verse 17, beginning there. And the psalmist says, since my youth, O God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to who? The next generation. Your children. Their children, their children, their children. And it continues to go down and down. Just think about it. For 2,000 years now, the glory of God, of Jesus Christ, has been handed down through all the generations. Here we sit. Evidently, God was first in their life. And he went on to say, you might, your might to all who are to come. Well, the only thing I can say is, who's going to be here a hundred years from now? I won't be here. If Christ hasn't returned Will this church, will our children remember that we are faithful? 
that God is number one. He is first in our life. Will they carry the torch? Will they hand down the chairs? Will they hand down the scriptures to those that come after us? I think about that once in a while when I started reading the book. Will they find us faithful? Will our ancestors find us faithful to God? There's one little section there in the Genesis that the author said he was not particularly fond of Jacob. And you know why? Jacob had a favorite, which was Joseph. He called that a dysfunctional family because by putting Joseph at his favorite, all the brothers and sisters hated him. Do you have favorite? It might be that you've got two children. You could always say, you're my favorite oldest and you're my favorite youngest. Right? When you're playing ball, you're my favorite person sitting on the bench. But the thing is, we need to love all of our children the same. They're all favorites. And look what happened of course, that was probably God's plan. Who was me to question it? And it worked out because God planned it that way. But when you think about it, uh oh, man, them brothers and sisters are going to hate me because I got that special coat and my dad loves me more than he loves them. But God was actually became first in the life of all of them, the patriarchs. I hope that uh, in sharing some of the stories that I read in this book, that we will think about it and we'll think about making God first. We'll think about, will our ancestors find us faithful to God? And I want to close with a verse of scripture from Psalms. I'm getting to where I like to end in the Psalms. And this happens to be the very last Psalm 150. And it says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heaven. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the tandor, tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and the flutes. Praise him with the clash of the cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our Father, we thank you that this day you have given to us. We thank you that you have uh, come here to be with us. We know that your spirit is alive and well in the life of each of us. We pray that as we go from here that those that uh, see us and find us faithful, that you are number one. And Father, I pray that you'll forgive us where we have failed you in this line. But life's not over until that last breath or your son returns to take us to be with him. Give us this day to give you praise and glory and honor. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.